Chat, chat, chat. Why are we all red? <laughs> there we go. Good afternoon. I'm Strom Carlson, this is Lucky225, and welcome to Phone Freaking in the Age of Voice over IP. We're having a little uh, problem with Lucky's laptop. Um, we're not getting video on it. So, yeah, we, uh, we had some slides prepared, but hopefully um, Lucky will be able to get it working before, uh, ho hopefully he'll be, he'll be able to get it working, but if not, I'll just try and explain everything to you as best I can, you know, how to make up the diagrams in your head. So anyway, how many of you, let, let's start off, how many of you consider yourselves phone freaks? Show of hands. <laughs> All right. How many of you work for a telephone company of some kind? Okay. <laughs> okay. How many of you know what signaling system 7 is? I noticed the hands that went up typically were not the people who considered themselves phone freaks. So, let's start off. In the old days, of course, during, uh, with the bell system and electric mechanical switching, there was all, all the signaling was in band, obviously. Multi-frequency, multi-frequency signaling in band, dial pulsing, crossbar pulsing, uh, revertive pulsing. Now, when, during the 1970s, the, uh, Bell Labs developed a thing called Signaling System 7, which is an out-of-band signaling uh, protocol, which is used to set up calls, tear down calls, and today it's pretty much ubiquitous, which is why things like blue boxing no longer work. Talk louder, what signal? No. Oh, we have, uh, yay, thank God, we have slides, so. While Lucky sets this up, I'm going to uh, talk about, briefly, I'm going to introduce you. You'll see all the, you see all the stuff on the table. The pay phones are not part of this. <laughs> so, but during the speech, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to randomly ask questions r related to what we spoke about. And if you, someone can answer them, you will win this stuff. So, free stuff. We have... Um, Western Electric line cards, we have weird technical books I found at the used bookstore, and we have an actual phone that you can win. Wow. Yay. This one? Yeah. Thanks. Do you have a pay phone? Hey, pardon? Do you have a pay phone? Yeah, two of them. Yeah. Search them up all the way through? No, no, no. eBay. <laughs> What's going on? I'm trying to uh, look at that screen. It's not working. There we go. Now it's working. Okay. What else? Now we can. <laughs> All right. I can see what I'm talking. Okay, so <laughs> introduction to signaling system seven. Now, typically, when you when you dial a call, this is an example call from here at the Alexis Park Hotel to a restaurant in Pacific Palisades, California, called Gladstones for Fish, and their telephone number is three ten Gladstone for Fish. So, typically, what you have here, this is. Alexis Park Hotel, and this is South 7, which is the Sprint local telephone office, which gives dial tone to the Alexis Park here. When you pick up the phone and you dial 310-GL4-FISH, the, uh, the local to, uh, end office uh, analyzes the call, routes it to the DMS 200 tandem in downtown Las Vegas with the main tandem. That tandem analyzes, and uh, let's assume, for example, that this call is going over AT&T's long distance network. So this DMS 200 tandem will pick up a trunk to the nearest number four ESS of AT&T's, which in this case is AT&T's San Bernardino 4 ESS, it, and then hand the call off to AT&T. The 4 ESS in San Bernardino picks up a trunk to the 4 ESS in Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles, and routes a call to there. That 4 ESS picks up a trunk to the 5 ESS tandem in Santa Monica, which then picks up a trunk to the GTT5 EAX end office in Pacific Palisades, which then rings the phone of Gladstones for Fish. Now, in the old days, what you would have is all the signaling would be over the same channels that the voice uh, call is going over. So you would have the trunks uh, pick up, you would hear 
multi-frequency tones going over them, or in some cases, your vertical pulsing. But today, you notice when you pick up the phone, you dial a long-distance call, it starts ringing almost immediately. This is due to signal X27. Lucky, someone's trying to hack you, Lucky. <laughs> Allow. Turn off sound alarm. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why are you running Windows, Lucky? <laughs> so, Signal System 7 has a network architecture which uses switches which are not part of the voice traffic. Your voice, call, your voice path is set up over one trunk, but the signaling occurs over different out trunks out of band. So the SSPs in this diagram are switching, SSP stands for switching service point. And the SSP is the dial tone office, the, do the office that rings your phone, the office that gets your dial tone. Basically, it's your standard D DMS 100 by the SS office. The STP is the signal transfer point, which is a very pa fast, very efficient, high volume packet switch. And SS7 is a packet switch network. It's all data and it's there are a number of packets, the most important for call for, of which for call setup is called the initial address message, the IAM. It's a huge packet with potentially hundreds of parameters in it. There are, but we'll get into that in a second. And then we have these things called the SCP, which is a switching control point. Now, the STPs are switches, but the sw switching control points are more like computers. Typically, the, one of the common uses for them is as databases. The switching control points contain things like the the 800 number lookup directory. So when you dial a toll-free call, the SC, it, uh, your end office, your SSP, does a database dip into the SCP and finds out which carrier that, that toll-free call is using, and then sort of routes the call to that carrier. Once the call gets to that carrier, then the carrier dips into their own SSP, finds the ring two number for that toll-free call, and then routes the call to that number. The other use for, SC, for the SCP is, for example, when you have caller ID with name. When the call routes to your end office, then, act well, actually, I'm getting into that later, so let's move on to the next slide. This is, this is a diagram of what happens for a successful ordinary call. This is just the call setup. This is between you dialing the call and the other party answering. This is what happens. You pick, first here, you pick up the call, and you pick up the phone and you dial your number. You originate the exchange, completes the backward connection, the audio path, and then transmits the initial address message, which, which contains all the call setup information, all the way through the various tandems, all the way to the destination switch, and then that switch checks to see whether the called party is available. If the called party is available... That wasn't me. That wasn't me. All right. <laughs> if the called party is available, then the switch will start ringing that telephone, and will um, will uh, will uh, it uh, it's once the basically <laughs> the terminating switch. What's going on, like with your phone? I don't know which phone is this. So, yeah, hang up. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to disconnect this until I need to use it. When the, when the terminating end office has received the IAM packet, then it sends an address complete message, which is basically like an acknowledge, all the way back to the originating switch. Then it starts ringing the telephone of the call party and sends call, call progress all the way back to the originating switch, which in this case would be a ring back so sound, an audible ringtone. And then, once the call party answers, a connect message is sent all the way back to the originating exchange. The call path is completed in the backwards direction so that you can hear the, your called party speaking. And then, billing starts, and charging begins. So, now the initial address message for signaling system 7 is equivalent if you, how many of you are familiar with ISDN protocol? Okay. The SS7 initial address message is equivalent to the ISDN setup message. There are dozens and dozens of parameters. If you look at the like the ITUT specification for SS7, what are you, what's going on with your phones, Lucky? If you look at the, uh, the ITUT specification for uh, SS7, the initial address message can contain hundreds and hundreds of parameters. Things like the geographic location of the calling party and 
um, you know, billing member class of service, but the most important ones for the purpose of this speech are the called party number, that has to be in there, the calling party number, which is optional, the billing telephone number, which I believe is, uh, is not optional, and the class of service, which is referred to as ANIII on the North American Number and Plan Administration's website. So it's time for the first question. For the Zilog Z8000 family data book, what is the equivalent of the ISDN setup message in SS7? In the back. That's right. Come up and get it. So, the billing telephone number is the charge number. This is what is traditionally referred to as ANI, automatic number identification. This is set at the switch level for both plain old telephone service and ISDN. This is um, used for call billing and accounting purposes, and it may be different from the calling party number. This boy. <laughs> It may be different than the calling party number. And the reason for this is because, say for example, in, okay, say for example you are calling from a hotel, from an office PDX. All the calls are built to, are built to one number, but you want to be able to identify which specific direct or dial line the call is coming from. So you have the billing telephone number set for the main number, but the DI, the calling party number is the, uh, is the, the number of the station you're calling from. So they can be different. ANIII is an extension to ANI, and this is class of service. Uh, it's sometimes called flexible ANI by some of the telephone companies. But no one seems to agree what the II actually stands for. Verizon calls it information indicator. Uh, Quest calls it information integers. And NENA, which is the, North Ameri uh, the National Emergency Number Association, calls it identification indicators. Information. Identification information. I should read my slides. And this is a summary of some of the digits that the ANIII can be. Most of you, when you call from, home, from the home phone, will have 00, zero which is non-coin service requiring no special treatment. Either 02 two or 23 two can be used for ANI failure. 27 is your typical you know, Western Electric one single slot coin phone with coin control signaling. 70 is uh, a COCOT. 61 through 63 are mobile phones and uh, 30 through 32 are intercept. 29 is prison service. <laughs> now, the calling party number is an interesting thing because it, for a regular plain old telephone service and basic rate ISDN is set at the switch level. However, if you have an, a primary rate ISDN line, what they do is they allow you to transmit your own calling party number into the network. And this is what is used to generate the caller ID, which is displayed on your home telephone. So, if, and again, this example that I'm using of the, the situation where you need this, if you have an office with a, you know, 500 people in it and they're all direct and more dial lines, if you, all the calls are built to, to the main number, then the billing telephone number will be set at that main number. But if you need to d display on the person you're calling's caller ID box what the, what the direct and more dial number you're calling from is, then the switch can set this. The, the actual PBX will set this. Now, even if you block your caller ID by dialing star 67, this number is always sent to the terminating end office of the party you're dialing. It's, there's a bit set in the IAM which pr uh, prevents presentation of, this, of the number to the called party, but it is sent all the way to the far end of the switch. So I there are many cases, and Lucky will talk about this, where actually even dialing star 67 may not prevent you from blocking your telephone number from the called party. But this doesn't have to be a valid number. It doesn't have to conform to the North American numbering plan at all. For example, a friend of mine was showing me his cell phone. He was troubleshooting something that was going on, and a customer said, well, any time I call a cell phone from my PBX, it displays this really weird long number, and he showed me the number. It was 14 digits long for North American uh, numbering plan telephone call. And apparently, the person who set up the PRI had actually programmed that into the PBX mistakenly. And, but the calling party number doesn't actually have to, have to exist in the IAM at all. Now, the way calling name delivery works is this. The calling name is not delivered to the called party from the originating end office. When you dial the number, the end office you're dialing uh, 
takes that number, first off, it determines whether or not the person you're calling has calling name delivery at all. If they do, what it does, it does a that Swish does a database dip into the SCP with that number, and the SCP returns the, no the name associated with that number. And this can be very useful, as Lucky will demonstrate later. So, uh, okay. What is the abbreviation for the packet switch in the SS7 network? SCP. Okay. You win. Kiss Ma Bell goodbye. <laughs> All right, lucky. No, I don't think so. Well, this part, first part. Should, right. hmm? Explain VoIP. You explain VoIP. I'll explain the network. Yeah, basically, uh, <coughs> we're going to be talking about voice over IP, which is a technology that allows telephone calls to be placed over the internet, um, either from computer to computer, or from computer to into the phone system, or with a analog telephone adapter and a VoIP service, you can actually place phone to phone calls using a broadband connection. Um, this is just an example of a VoIP call that routes into the PSTN, which is a public switch telephone network. Uh, basically, it just goes through the internet and, uh, and yeah, go. <laughs> the way this routes is, if this is the phone you're dialing from, then you have either an analog terminal adapter or an actual voice over IP phone, which connects to, to the internet, usually through your cable or DSL modem, or if you know, in your, if you're in an office, then it'll connect through your uh, your T1 line, and it goes from the internet to the VoIP provider's point of presence. From there, it hits the public switch network. It'll, in this example, you're dialing into a big city like Los Angeles, and you're dialing a number there. So it'll hit a point of presence in Los Angeles. Then it'll hit the local exchange carrier's access tandem. So for example, Pacific Bell's tandem on Grand Avenue in downtown Los Angeles. And then it'll go to the end office you're, uh, you're calling and ring the phone. In the second example, if you're calling a more rural area where they don't have a point of presence, it'll route over a standard inter inter exchange carrier's long distance network. But for the most part, it's pretty much the same. All right, and um, messing around with a lot of these voice over IP services, um, which is a new technology, uh, basically we found a few exploits, main one caller ID spoofing, and um, also number trapping, which is uh, actually obtaining someone's call party number uh, just by having them call your phone number. Uh, so even if they star six seven or block their caller ID, you can still get their phone number just by having them call your phone. The first exploit I'm going to talk about is uh, one with Vonage number portability. And <laughs> basically, all you have to do is call up Vonage at 18 uh, Vonage Help, or no, 1 Vonage Help, and um, order their service. And you can tell them, yeah, I'd also like to uh, port my cell phone over there. And you can give them any phone number that's portable to the Vonage network. And they'll go ahead and set it up so that your caller ID is actually that phone number on every outgoing call. They'll so give you a virtual number for you uh, for people to temporarily call you while you're sending in your letter of authorization, which allows them to actually port the number over. Um, but even if you don't send in the letter of authorization, they still have your caller ID set to your cell phone number. And um, when, you, when you place outgoing calls, that's what it'll say. And not only that, if someone on the Vonage network tries to call your cell phone, instead of getting their cell phone, they'll actu it'll actually ring your Vonage uh, phone which I'm going to demonstrate right here how this works. Oh, wait. Is this camera on? Yeah. It should be. Hold on. I'm having my calls for it. Great. <laughs> um, here, let me switch the. As we like to say in the phone business, we're sorry. <laughs> we're experiencing difficulty. Please try to call in. Um, I'm second. I have two Vonage lines here. I was going to try and call one and show the caller ID of uh, my first. 
but I, I'm currently having the first one forwarded to my cell phone, which is why it kept ringing. Um, <laughs> but so instead, because I can't show you the caller ID, I'm just going to call 800-444-4444, which, which will uh, actually read back the phone number to you. Calling MCI. Our system indicates you're calling from two zero six two zero three. <laughs> Hold on. Thank <laughs> you for calling MCI. Our system indicates you're calling from two zero two eight six. Some of you might have recognized that as 212-867-5309, Jenny's number, in New York. Did they try to sell that on eBay? Yeah, they tried to sell that on eBay for $80,000, and Vonage uh, won't report it without a letter of authorization. <laughs> Now, if somebody on Vonage tries to call that, instead of getting uh, the voicemail, which it should be ringing to, if someone's on a Vonage line right now, it'll actually ring my phone like it's ringing right now. Um, and I'll try and demonstrate that with my second Vonage line. Wait, is that plugged in? The white one? Yeah, there we go. No dial tone. Oh, here we go. Is that going to pick up? <laughs> For those of you that can decode DTMF, that was 212-867-5309. <laughs> so, as you can see, I mean, this can come in pretty useful because you can basically port anyone's phone number that's portable. And, um, when they try, if someone on Vonage tries to call that phone number, instead of reaching the actual person, they'll reach your Vonage line. Um, <laughs> okay, I see that's wrong. So, we'll leave that. <laughs> okay. Quick, so I'm so this. Next export I'm going to talk about, it doesn't look like we have time to demonstrate this. Um, this one was found by Doug over there. <laughs> and this is uh, with a service called Voice Pulse, which you can sign up at voicepulse.com. They offer unlimited long distance and a whole lot of features. One of them which is called anonymous call rejection with prompting. Now what this feature does is when you turn that feature on and someone calls to try so someone tries to call your voice post line, it'll, uh, if they call it with their caller ID blocked, it'll say, the number does not accept blocked calls. Why don't you just tell me where you're calling from? And you punch in the phone number that you want to call from, and that's what will show up on the caller ID. Now, if you turn on call forwarding, you can actually forward all your calls to the number that you want to spoof to, and you just call up your voice post number with the caller ID blocked, and it'll it'll ask you what number do you want to call from and you punch it in and then it'll call your friend or whoever you're trying to call and when they look at their caller ID it'll see whatever you punched in. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about another exploit with VXML uh, which is a basically voice XML. It's a scripting language for phones. It's what Telme uses and uh, basically you can go to erase.us slash bvocal.xml and uh, sign up for Bevocal XML service at cafe.bevocal.com. And if you upload that script, you can call their 1-800 number and just punch in uh, the phone number you want to call from and the phone number you want to call to, and it'll give you a free one-minute call with your caller ID spoofed. 
Um, I was also going to talk about back spoofing, which is uh, basically you just spoof caller ID back to your home line. And when you look at the caller ID, the name that'll show up is the actual name associated with that phone number. So if you have a phone number and you don't know what the name or the business is of that number, you can just call yourself and it'll show the name right on your caller ID. Um, okay. Three minutes left. Okay, I got three minutes left. I got this. Is basically, I was just going to talk about trapping your call party number. You can sign up for a voicemail called K7.net, and they'll give you a Seattle 206 number. And it'll it's just like any other voicemail, but when anyone calls it, even if they block their call ID and the voicemail message, it'll have their phone number on it. Um, another example is Free World Dial Up, um, which is another VoIP service, and you can use a Supra device to uh, make calls with it. You can give people your free world dial-up extension, which is, this is a free service. And, uh, anyone, ha anyone that calls 248-724-0700, when they key in your free world dial-up number, on the caller ID, it'll show their phone number, whether or not it's blocked. Um, and call forwarding, basically the same thing as K7 or anything else. You can just have your home phone number forwarded to one of these K7 voicemails, and the phone company will automatically forward their call party number to your voicemail, and then it'll get trapped. So you can give out your home phone number, have it call forwarded to your K7 voicemail, and when anyone calls and leaves a message, it'll have their phone number in the message. Um, we were going to talk about asterisk. We don't have a, our speaker here, with the, here today. Um, but basically, there's some IAX providers that you can just set your call party number to whatever you want. And you can have people call your asterisk number, and it'll show the call party number when they call your asterisk line. And you can have it set up just like a regular phone, and there's all kinds of other neat stuff you can do with asterisk. And that's pretty much the end of our speech. It's 7 o'clock. Strom? Okay, so we have a couple minutes left, so let's do one more trivia question for the phone. What's the name of the restaurant I referred to at the beginning of the speech? I can't tell who, who yelled at first. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. What at, what street? What street in downtown Los Angeles is Pacific Bell's DMS Tandemon? Get the phone. And I'm going to give you the, uh, this software from some ancient computer from 1982. Yes, you. So we have any questions quickly? No, sorry. In caller ID unblocking using asterisk, what would be the configuration file you would need? In caller ID unblocking using asterisk, what would be the configuration file you need? Thank you. Um, basically, you just have to set the caller ID field, uh, let's see, what was that? No, unblocking for incoming, I think, right? Unblocking yeah, for incoming? Unblock. Huh? For unblocking. For, in for incoming, right? Yeah, incoming, once you're there, contact. The provider will automatically send the number and it'll be in your logs. Is that necessary to have the uh, PRI connection? No, no, no. It, it, you, the, prov the voice over IP provider will usually just send the number to you. Yes, ask away. How can you unblock a block number on a cell phone? I'm Call forward your cell phone to a K7 voicemail, and usually it'll get right on you. When they leave a message on the voicemail, it'll have their phone number on it. For incoming calls. Yes, for incoming calls. Is it possible to spoof any II? Yes and no. <laughs> you can you can spoof we're, we're at, we're at you can spoof with some PBXs that will forward your call ID. Hey, pardon? Yeah, it's a 